close conjecture uh, on the core normal module. Uh, so I invite him to present part two of his talk. Thank you. Thanks again for the invite. Um, and I guess thanks for everyone for coming back or coming for the first time, maybe. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if you weren't here last time, I'll try to make this talk somewhat self-contained, but it will at the very least be much less motivated. Plan is to talk about this thing called the homotopy Lie algebra. And uh, today I will actually explain the construction of it. Last time on Tuesday, I explained uh, why it's cool and tried to give some interesting facts about it. But today I'll actually tell you how to build it. And then using that, I'll explain how to prove this conjecture. OK, so to remind you, uh, you should tell me if I'm, this, everything is large enough again. So the setting is we have a subjective local homomorphism, and it has finite projective dimension, which means that the uh, this S, as considered as an R module through this map, is a module of finite projective dimension. So uh, in this setting, Pascal and Sales had this conjecture from 1979, 1978, which says uh, if the projective dimension of the kernel module is finite, then phi had to be a complete intersection, which means that this ideal i, the kernel of this map, is generated by a regular sequence. So the goal is to prove this conjecture today, in the next hour or so, um, using this thing called the homotopy Lie algebra. Um, right, and then here's this. Uh, I wrote this down last time just to remind you what the actual, uh, concretely, the connection between the kernel module i mod i squared and the homotopy Lie algebra is that. Uh, in degree two, the homotopy Lie algebra is actually just the dual of the kernel module. And this is how they're going to get, this is how these two things are going to get linked up. OK. Um, so the actual structure of the proof, uh, the main two things that go into it are this, uh, these two results. So um, I also had these written down last time, so I'm cheating and just copying them out again. The first one is this result of Avramov and Halperin from 1987, which is a criterion uh, for when you have a convenient section using the homotopy Lie algebra. So our goal is to prove that we have a convenient section. Um, so it's nice that this, this theorem has that as its conclusion. Um, the hypotheses say that uh, what we're trying to prove is that every single element in pi 2 is radical, which means that if you uh, take brackets with it enough time, you get 0. So if you keep bracketing with this element, you're going to get 0. Um, maybe to remind you, uh, if you have a complete intersection, there was, I explained from last time, um, this implies that the homotopy Lie algebra is only concentrated in degrees 1 and 2. So uh, after that, it's just 0. And um, since it's a graded Lie algebra, uh, taking the bracket with something in degree 2 is going to keep increasing the degree. So suddenly, if your homotopy Lie algebra stops in degree 2, everything has to be radical, because you're going to uh, the degree is going to increase until you get 0 almost straight away. Um, so this is our goal to explain why. Uh, we can get everything in degree 2 to be radical. And there's a theorem. This is sort of the main, maybe technical theorem from this preprint um, about Vasconcelos conjecture. Um, it's a criterion for how do you tell if an element is radical. So to remind you, using this bijection here. So um, if you take an element which is dual to the Konoha module, so a map from the Konoha module to k, um, and think of it as uh, something in pi 2. What we're trying to prove is that if this element here factors going via a module here, m, of which is finitely generated and has finite projective dimension, then u is radical. So uh, this is how this, the proof goes. So um, if you combine these two results, uh, if you assume the kernel module itself has finite projective dimension, then you can always just take uh, i mod i squared to be equal to this module m. Um, which is going to imply that every single element is radical, which is going to imply that you have a convenient section by this theorem. So these two results together are a Vasconcelos' conjecture. And today, what I'm going to do is prove this. Um, although most of the talk will be taken up with actually explaining how to construct a homotopy Lie algebra. So that's the first thing we do. So maybe before we get into that, if I can just check, you can interrupt whenever or in the chat or however, if you have questions about the structure. What's going on? OK. So it begins with DG algebras. So uh, this whole construction is using the, the algebra of DG algebras. So a D, whoops. A DGR algebra 
is a chain complex. Uh, say A. And I'm always going to assume my DG algebras are non-negatively graded in degree greater than or equal to zero. And it should also be whoops, an, uh, a graded R algebra structure. So it's a chain complex, which is simultaneously a graded R algebra. And um, the way in which these two structures has to be compatible is that this multiplication map has to be a chain map. So actually, the multiplication has to respect the differential. And if you work out what this means, this is just um, saying that this is a chain map gives you the Leibniz rule that the differential applied to AB is D of AB plus minus 1 to whatever the degree of A is, A D of B. OK, so this is the structure which we're going to be working with for most of the today's talk. Um, I think uh, even if you're not used to working with DG algebras, there's probably an example of this which you are used to working with, perhaps, which is that uh, if you take a few a list of elements in your base ring R, uh, an example of a DG algebra would be the Cajol complex on these elements. So this is the way to define this is it's just the exterior algebra. on some generators uh, xi, all having degree 1. And the boundary of these elements, uh, xi is, the boundary of xi is the corresponding fi. So uh, just to be clear, what this means for n equals 1 is just that um, in degree 0, I have r. And in degree 1, I have my variable. And because it's an exterior algebra, x1 squared is 0, so I have nothing more than that. And the differential here takes x1 to f1. So it looks sort of like that. And for n equals 2, I'm going to have two variables. And the differential of x1 is f1, and the differential of x2 is f2. So it looks sort of like this in degrees 0 and 1. But now since I have an exterior algebra, I also have x1 times x2. Um, so, And that lives in degree 2 now. And I have nothing more than that. That's uh, that's what the full exterior algebra looks like. And so the reason that here I've only told you what the differential does on these variables xi is because it's determined by the Leibniz rule. So we can work out what d of x1 times x2 is. That is d of x1 x2 minus x1 d of x2. If we use the Leibniz rule, so that's f1 x2 minus f2 x1. So uh, if I draw this in on this picture, then that would be minus f2 here and f1 here. So this is what the Cajol complex looks like on two generators. And then it continues uh, in general for size n. It's sort of it's a free module of rank 2 to the n. And there's some differential determined by what the Leibniz rule does, sort of like this, with various signs in various places. OK, so this is an example of a DG algebra, a very nice example of a DG algebra. Um, and in fact, this will come up a lot more in a minute. Um, but we now need some more definitions for now. So more definitions. Um, the next definition is about what kind of DG algebras we, what specifically kind of DG algebras we want to use. We want to use our DG algebras to give resolutions. So we want to do kind of free resolutions, but free DG algebra resolutions. So I, I'm going to tell you what a free DG algebra is for us. And like the kind which is uh, the sort of res the kind which we want for our resolutions. So uh, first thing that goes into that is uh, I'd start with a set of variables, and I want to assign elements of my set gradings. So it's um, a graded set of variables. So a graded set would just be a set where the elements are given grade gradings, which means that it's decomposed into x1, x2, x3, and so on. So it's a disjoint union. Um, then the free strictly graded commutative R algebra on x is 
I'm going to write it R of X as if it were a polynomial ring. But what that means really is that in odd degrees, I take the exterior, exterior algebra on that. And in even degrees, I take the polynomial ring, the symmetric algebra on that. So this is what it means uh, for each strictly graded commutative. So it's graded commutative in the sense that odd things anti-commute with each other. And it's strictly graded commutative in the sense that, in fact, odd things are square zero as well, which is just a, oops extra little thing you need to say. Um, so here's a, the important definition that we need to the kind of DG algebra we want to resolve things with is um, a DG algebra is called semi-free if it is isomorphic to such a thing as an algebra. So if the underlying just graded algebra of it, just ignoring the differential, happens to be a free strictly graded commutative DG algebra, sorry, free strictly graded commutative R algebra, um, then it is called semi-free. Uh, but it also has some differential, which is sort of not free. That's why the the word semi is there, because only, only as a graded algebra, it's free. So um, if you're used to building free resolutions of things, this might make sense. Uh, if you phrase things in terms of this. So free resolution would be like a big free module, a graded free module, plus some differential on it, which does something. So it's sort of like that. Um, so as an example, we've already seen one of these. The Kajol complex on any number of generators is semi-free. Because the underlying graded algebra of it is just an exterior algebra, and that counts as free. So where am I up to? Um, OK. So back to the original setting of, say, a subjective local homomorphism like this, we can build, oh, there is already, OK, uh, free and semi-free. Um, the difference between free and semi-free is that free is just uh, something for graded algebras. So uh, free, I guess, is short for free strictly graded commutative our algebra, and it's just saying that as a graded algebra, it is a exterior algebra on some generators and a symmetric algebra on some generators in even degree tensor together. So it's um, that's sort of what it means to be free as a graded algebra. And semi-free is a is an adjective which applies to uh, DG algebras, uh, and the semi just means that okay, as a graded algebra, it's free, and then it also has some differential on it. So the Kajol complex is a good example because it's um, the, as a graded algebra, it's an exterior algebra, and then it also has some differential, which does it decreases, which goes down into degree and does something. Okay. Okay. So one can build, given a ring homomorphism, a kind of a semi-free DG algebra, DG R algebra resolution. of S. So i.e. what this means is we're going to build uh, A is a semi-free DDR algebra. And it's going to come with a, so maybe I'll uh, sneak some extra. Uh, so it's going to come with a map to S. and it's going to be the case that this map induces an isomorphism, so like this. So what this means is A is a complex in particular, uh, so we can think of it as like potentially a resolution. Um, we can take its homology groups into the complex, and if I want it to be a resolution of S. That means I want it to be exact in positive degrees, so the homology is just zero in positive degrees, and in degree zero, it just gives me S. So this is what it, just like for a free resolution, I want it to um, be this. But it, it's so the way to think about this is it is in fact a free resolution, but it also has the structure of a DG algebra. Uh, okay, so uh, the next thing I want to do is explain how to build that. So it's a construction. Uh, so it's similar to the way you would build a free, just a normal free resolution of a module. You just inductively add variables over and over and over and keep going forever if you have to. So uh, step one goes like this. 
maybe I'll clear some space. So, um, before we start, uh, R2S is subjective, so I can write it as an exact sequence like that. And the idea is to continue this to a sort of DGAlgebra resolution. Uh, the kernel of this map, I'm always calling that I, and that is, say, generated by some F1 up to Fn. And the way you would build a free resolution would be to adjoin a free module of rank n and use the differential to sort of kill those f1 up to fn. And so that's what we do here, except we need it to be an algebra. So in fact, we take the Cajol complex on these ones. And then uh, the homology of this thing, at least in degree 0, is going to be correct. It's going to be uh, r mod these f's. So when you take a Cajol complex on some number of generators, the degree zero homology is always what you want it to be. It's R modulo those generators. So in that case, it's S. This one here, by the way, is just this, uh, indexing the step. So it's not. this is not the grading degree, uh, not homological or anything. It's just, uh, that's why I put it in brackets to try to indicate that it's not a grading. It's just indicating which step I'm on. So the next step will be A sub two and so on. Um, OK, so this is the first step of the, the construction. There's two things that could happen here. Either uh, when we look at the positive degree homology of this, maybe we get 0. Well, sorry, I should be. Maybe we get 0 when we look in positive degrees here. So um, if that happens, then uh, i.e. the Cajol complex on these elements here is exact. That's the same as saying, sorry, sorry if this is annoying to look at. I keep tapping it accidentally. Um, this is the same as saying that uh, these f's form a regular sequence, uh, which is the same as saying phi is complete in section. OK, so uh, in this case, we're done. I, we've constructed a resolution. So I'm gonna, just going to take a to be this, and that is our resolution, because it's already uh, has all the properties I wanted it to. It's a semi-free DG algebra, and it has its, as its homology the same as S. So that would be great. Um, but more often than not, uh, you're going to be in the situation that the, so you're in one of these two situations. You're probably going to be like this. And in that case, I should definitely make more space. So let's go here. Uh, step two would be to take uh, cycles say z1 up to z uh, m in degree 1, which give a, which generate h1. So like if you were building a resolution, you would take some cycles, and then you would try to get rid of them by making a free module in one degree higher and setting the differential to get rid of them. So it goes like this. Uh, you take a2. The second step of the construction would be to adjoin some new variables, whoops, to adjoin some new variables to your previous step, say x1 up to xm now. And these things are going to have degree two. And I'm going to set their boundaries to be the corresponding cycles which I want to kill, like this. Then uh, so uh, this has the desired effect that now these cycles here become zero in the homology here because they've become boundaries. So um, it's very much like building a free resolution, except every time you adjoin some variables, uh, you have to adjoin all of their products and all of their powers and everything, a whole lot of things behind it. So even though we've only got to the second step, this thing now is an infinite complex, which is going on forever, because these are polynomial variables. In degree two, um, my variables have to be polynomial, which means all of their powers are non-zero and stuff like that, which means this is already infinite. So it's not very efficient if you want a small resolution, but this is necessary when we, if we want a, DG, a nice free DG algebra resolution. So just like building resolution, except you also have to adjoin all your products and stuff like that. Step n. So anyway, uh, you continue this construction to step n, say, where the nth step would be another semi-free DG algebra where I've adjoined variables up to degree n, and it also has some differential on it. Um, and then you probably will have to go on forever, in which case step infinity was what we'll call A. That's our desired resolution, and that's just the union of all the 
ans. So that would be r of x, where x is equal to the union of all of, all of the x ends. So I'm trying to write a capital X here. These are not like a, um, these ones are small x. They're supposed to be variables. And capital X is like a set of variables. It's a set of, uh, capital X is a set of all the variables which we had at all stages. OK, so this is our desired resolution. This uh, uh, has the desired properties. A is a semi-free DG R algebra resolution. Of S by construction, and I've left a little space there because I also want to point out that it's local, which might seem like a weird thing to put here, but this is actually going to be very important. Um, it is a local DG algebra in the sense that it has exactly one graded maximal ideal, and the graded maximal ideal of it is uh, in degree zero, A is A agrees with R, and so it has the maximum ideal of R there, and it also has all these variables, so say X1, X2, X3, and so on forever. Um, so it has this maximum ideal, and that's its unique maximum ideal. So it is local, but it's um, not in the theorem. This is an infinitely generated ideal, uh, which will be pertinent later. Um, OK, so we've managed to construct this thing. And I don't know, the main thing to take away is that it's an inductive kind of construction, which is similar to just how you would build a normal free resolution. But you have to remember to join products at each stage. OK, um, here is a theorem of Avramov, um, which tells you something about uh, the form of this thing when you build it. So if uh, at each stage, you choose these cycles generating an homology to be minimal generators of, say, your homology at the corresponding stage, I don't know, say, like this. Uh, then, so I, if as long as you do this minimally, which is a very reasonable thing to do, why wouldn't you do that? So uh, you try to make A as small as possible. You adjoin in as few variables as you can at every step. Um, then, like the in local commutative algebra, you have this characterization of what a minimal resolution is in terms of the maximum ideal. There's a corresponding thing here. Uh, this is, in fact, is equivalent to saying that the differential satisfies this thing in terms of this maximum ideal. That uh, the differential of anything lands inside m squared, the maximum ideal squared. So, i.e., boundaries are always decomposable. Which means they can be written as a sum of products of things from the maximum ideal. Okay, uh, so having done this, A is called uh, the most common word in commutative algebra for a resolution of this form, a minimal one, is called a minimal model. Say a minimal model for uh, for S over R, or a minimal model for phi. It's not the same as the minimal model in algebraic geometry. This phrase minimal model is kind of overused. But um, uh, alternative term terminology that, the, that you would see, the older terminology from rational homotopy theories, you would call this a Sullivan model, because this construction was essentially invented by Sullivan to, uh, to be able to do com computations in rational homotopy theory. And then it was adapted to commutative algebra by Avramov. And then maybe another uh, terminology you would see is resolvent. Resolve because it resolves S. Um, OK. So let me just find where I am on minutes. OK. So finally, I can tell you how, how to build the homotopy Lie algebra. Let's see, the construction is a bit involved, but it, um, the thing you need to know about is how to resolve by a DG algebra. So you start with uh, I from R to S. A subjective homo local homomorphism. We're going to build a minimal model.
like this, then the homotopy Lie algebra uh, is going to be defined like this. So the degree i piece of the homotopy Lie algebra is you look at the variables which you found on degree i minus 1. So you there's a shift involved. Um, you look at the variables which you needed in the previous the previous step, i minus 1, and then you just take the dual vector space on that. So you take your k, always the residue field is k, and dualize it. So i pi i of phi has a basis dual to those variables um, from xi minus 1. OK, so in particular, uh, if you remember from last time, I talked about these d, uh, numbers called the deviations of a homomorphism. These were epsilon i of phi. These were, by definition, just the dimension of the homotopy Lie algebra in the i place. So this is going to be the size of xi minus 1. So the deviations measure how many variables do you need to add at each step when you build this DG algebra resolution. I should say, um, I should probably have, uh, maybe as part of this, uh, a consequence of this theorem is that this is unique up to isomorphism. We have to write that in. So uh, minimal models are actually unique up to isomorphism, just like minimal free solutions. So all of this is totally well defined. Um, OK. That's how you see what the uh, homotopy Lie algebra is as a vector space. And I can tell you what the bracket is as well. It's quite, uh, it's quite an interesting construction. The bracket is encoded by the differential, by d. It looks like this. So if you take some variable xi in some degree, um, according to Avramov's minimality theorem about um, what the differential has to look like, it's a decomposable thing. So I can write this as a sum over a i j k of x j x k, uh, where these things are in R. And I'm summing over various i, j, k. Um, and I can also have cubic and higher things. But this is my quadratic part. And I also should be more careful. Since I have mr, since the maximum ideal of A also involves the maximum ideal of R, there's stuff from the maximum ideal of R which I'm going to ignore as well. So stuff which is cubic in the variables and higher, we ignore. And stuff which comes from which has coefficients in the maximum ideal, we also ignore that. What I'm interested here is just the quadratic part of the differential, which involves products of two things from the variables. And here, this is some coefficients, which we'll take modulo. Oops. OK. OK. Then we get the formula for the bracket by sort of dualizing this formula. So the bracket of j and k, uh, xj and xk dual. So my variables are dual to my elements of homotopy Lie algebra. This is the sum over all the corresponding i, j, and k of all of the a, i, j, k that I get. Uh, and x i dual. OK, and I should put a bar over here because I'm considering this in k. So that's what I mean by I'm ignoring stuff with coefficients in the maximum ideal of r because they're going to become 0 anyway. So I'm only looking at things modulo m. OK, so the way to read this is, yeah? Uh, a question from Miyazaki. Uh, do you need to add i? Do I need to add i? Uh, at which point was this asked? Here? Uh, yeah, I think so. Do I need to add i? Is this because of the degree, you mean? Uh, Miyazaki, can you ask Can you ask your question, Miyazaki? What, what is i? Uh, Here, i is I... in the letters, yes, yes. So uh, I is fixed. Uh, I is just some index here. Um, so so I is fixed. So you don't need to 
Oh. Right up. I, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's correct. Whoops. All right. That's correct. Yeah. So I should have only summed over here. And again, here I made the same mistake. Um, here I kind of do a re the reverse sum and sum over the J and, uh, sorry, here I do sum over the I. I sum over all I for which these occur. So one thing which is going on in this sum is to point out that uh, for a given I or for a given J and K, uh, only finitely many of these A, I, J, K are non-zero. So this sum here is finite and this sum here is finite. Um, there's really a dualization going on here because the differential is sort of going from x here to x squared here. It's taking variables and giving me products of variables. And the idea is the bracket dualizes it and gives me taking two variables to just one variable once I dualize. So the bracket is actually the dual of this map. That's what this means when you unravel this structure constant definition. So you can define the bracket in this way. Um, and I will, sorry. I think it's correct. Oh, and um, I should be much more careful. There is a sign involved to make this work properly that I have in my notes. It's a minus, whoops, times minus 1 to the j plus 1. Sorry about that. OK. So uh, one can define the bracket like this. And I'll give a better, I'll give a sort of more coordinate-free definition of it in a second, or a proposition which explains it. Um, so I'll just write down a theorem. Uh, the theorem is that having made this definition with this seemingly strange definition of a bracket, uh, so this would be a theorem of Quillen and Sullivan and of Avramov. That uh, this definition makes it into a Lie algebra is a graded Lie algebra. And this is something which I won't really explain, but if you know about the, you can take the universal envelope of a graded Lie algebra and get a graded associative algebra, and it gives you the X algebra of this. DG algebra, you take A tensor of R of K, K, K. Um, so then there is a question. Uh, yeah. one, uh, why the bracket is alternating? Oh, that's quite nice. So um, yeah, the fact that there are sort of three things to check, maybe. The fact that the degrees match up is kind of interesting. That's there, Remember, there was a shift here. This i here corresponds to i minus 1 here. That's what makes the degree match up. So whatever the degree of this is and the degree of this is, this is the sum of the two degrees of that. Um, even though this degree here is minus 1, that shift accounts for that. Anti-symmetry, you can also um, uh, check. That's because um, I can even squeeze that in. Anti-symmetry is because x i, x, let's say x j, x k. If you wanted to switch them around like here, uh, x j x k is minus one to the j k x k x. Um, I shouldn't have written like that. N m, where if the degree of x j is n and the degree of x k is m. So when you switch two variables, uh, a sign appears like this because it's graded commutative. But um, because there is a shift involved in the homotopy Lie algebra, this has degree n minus 1 and m minus 1. So uh, when you work out what the signs happen, what happens to the sign when you include that difference, uh, you, minus 1 to the n minus 1 times m minus 1 is the negative of this. So uh, if you rewrite this with the new gradings, which come from shifting, then you get a minus sign in front. So that's just something to check. The fact that, um, yeah, the fact that the A itself, the DG algebra resolution, is graded commutative means that when you do the shifting, it becomes uh, graded anti-commutative instead. Sorry, I'm trying to. 
OK. And there's a, one more thing to check would be the Jacobi identity. And that's truly kind of a miracle. It just is a difficult computation that turns out to be true. So that would be all of this kind of goes back to things uh, from Quillen at the beginning of rational homotopy theory. And this approach is due to Sullivan, who would have first checked that this is a, who would have first observed that the Jacobi identity comes up like this. And uh, it was Avramov who imported this to community of algebra, and in particular, Avramov who would have made the positive characteristic version of this work to get an actual gradedly algebra with the Jacobi identity. OK, so next thing, where am I up to? Let's start a new page. The rest of the proof is actually going to be phrased in terms of derivations. So a derivation, uh, say theta, which goes from my DG algebra to some B, uh, is an R linear map of some degree i. And it should satisfy, sorry, every time I touch it, it does that. Uh, the differential, whoops, sorry, the theta applied to a, b is theta of a times b plus minus 1 to whatever the degree of a is multiplied by i, a theta of b. So it's another, the Leibniz rule showing up again, but with the correct grading, the correct signs for the grading. Uh, and the important thing about when there is a comment from uh, Nazib. Oh yeah, so su um, super Lie algebra is, is correct. Um, this is just another. Uh, in some areas you would call this a graded Lie algebra, and in some areas you would call this a super Lie algebra. So yeah, um, what what I mean is exactly what you mean by super Lie algebra that it satisfies the it's anti it's graded anti symmetric and satisfies the grade the graded Jacobi identity. Correct. Um, OK, so since my DG algebra is semi-free, uh, any derivation any derivation like this, which comes out of A, is uniquely determined by what it does on the variables on theta of x. Right. So once I say, once I um, write down what theta does to the variables, then the um, this uh, Leibniz rule will determine what it does on everything. So uh, derivations from A into K, say, into its residue field. Let's put a degree here and say there are linear derivations from A into K. This would be the same as just functions on the variables uh, having degree I. Um, which means uh, this is just, so what I really mean by HOM to K is just the dual vector space of um, I, like this, um, which we've already decided is pi I plus 1 of I. So um, here's a slightly more invariant way of saying what the homotopy algebra is. It is uh, given by derivations from A into K. So uh, this is actually the description I'll be working with. Mostly. So we'll talk about derivations from A into K and how that matches up with the homotopy algebra. Um, so to recap, um, one way of thinking of the construction of the homotopy algebra is you take your original map from R to S, you resolve S by a semi-free DG algebra, and sort of take S and replace it with this A, this semi-free DG algebra, and then you just take derivations and you uh, you just plug that into derivations into K. So. It's sort of a like a derived functor type thing where you resolve it and then plug that in, plug that resolution into your functor. Um, if you know about Andrew Quillen cohomology, then a very similar construction will give you Andrew Quillen cohomology if you use uh, a simplicial resolution instead of a DG algebra resolution. That's a slightly different construction, which gives a slightly different thing. Um, okay, here's a good place to mention since x one. That was the, the first variables we added, the first step in the resolution. The idea of it was to, um, how are we doing for it? First step in the resolution uh, was to choose generators for i and then set them equal to 0 using the boundary. So this, the boundary of x1 is exactly a minimal set of generators for i. So 
uh, pi 2 of phi, as I promised to explain, that's just given by, um, well, um, x1 to k because of that shift that 2 corresponds to that 1, um, which is just met, uh, you can think of that as just functions, or linear functions from uh, i into k, which is, I suppose, isomorphic to s linear functions from i mod i squared to k. So I guess here I'm using this fact that one way to think of the Connor module is that it's just take the ideal i and tensor it with s like this. OK, so this is explaining that uh, y pi 2 is actually just given by the dual of the Connor module. So this is uh, how they're going to get connected. And in fact, I can be a bit better about this construction. I can phrase this in terms of derivations in a bit more structural way. So in fact, um, in terms of derivations, uh, we can look in degree 1 and look at the boundary uh, of a in degree 1. This gives, uh, we start with a, and then I'm going to ignore everything else in degree not 1 and just apply the boundary to uh, to get into i, and then I'm going to quotient down to get into uh, i mod i squared. And I'm going to call this delta, because it's kind of built from this. So the uh, that's just here. The fact that the boundary of a, the del, satisfies the Leibniz rule implies that this is a derivation. This is a derivation. And we're going to use this derivation in a minute. Um, and the above isomorphism is given by, so pi 2, we're going to think of that as derivations of degree 1 from a into k, and um, s i mod i squared to k. These are supposed to be isomorphic, and the isomorphism is just if I have a u here, then I just send this over to uh, the derivation, which first does delta and then does this u. So that's a derivation as well. OK, so this isomorphism, we can think of it as given by uh, precomposing with this delta. Um, and for some of you, this may be reminiscent of the formula for Kähler differentials. And that sort of is what, what's going on here. I mod I squared is secretly a kind of higher module of Kähler differentials, a sort of degree one Kähler differential thing is happening. Um, so we need one more ingredient. For the next, if we have 15 minutes, we should be OK, um, which is that uh, we have an exact sequence of complexes that goes m a, maximum ideal of a, and a, and then the residue field k. So here is where we're, again, going to be exploiting the fact that uh, a is actually a local DG algebra, has this short exact sequence coming from it. But um, unlike the usual sequence for just a ring, maximum ideal of ring k, this is a short exact sequence of complexes. These uh, Maybe this one doesn't have a differential on it, but these two have um, interesting differentials. Um, so what I'm going to use is uh, I'm going to use the long exact sequence coming from this. Uh, in particular, I'm going to use the connecting homomorphism. Uh, we get from this a connecting homomorphism when we plug in derivations that goes derivations from a into k. Uh, so derivations from a into k, just like the uh, connecting homomorphism for x, there's one for derivations, uh, which is going to start here and then increase the degree and give us derivations into m. So let's say if I put i minus 1 here, it gives us a degree i derivation from a into the maximum ideal. So like this. And the point is here, that's. Sorry for squeezing, but that's pi i of phi. 
So an interesting thing happened here is that i is now the same degree here. And if I take an element inside the homotopy Lie algebra, my notation for this is going to be u goes to theta of u, theta sub u. So, OK. OK, so the final ingredient is this proposition, which says, um, I can use this connecting homomorphism to compute the bracket in the homotopy Lie algebra. It goes like this. So we uh, make this identification. The homotopy Lie algebra, we think of this as given by uh, choose a semi free, minimal semi free DG algebra resolution and take derivations into K. Then the, or I'll put star here, star minus one. Uh, then if U and V, are in the homotopy Lie algebra, then the way we can compute that bracket is by um, we take u and send it over to theta of u. And then we do v, and we put a minus sign here, because that's how it works out when you do the computation. So let me explain this in a second. So I uh, we do theta of u. That goes from A, and it lands inside the maximum ideal of A, which is in particular just sitting inside A. And then my V, we're thinking of it as a derivation to K, like this. And it turns out just composing these gives us the bracket, U bracket V, or at least minus it, so the minus sign there. So uh, here, this is kind of a simple, it looks a little strange, but it's a simple way of describing what the bracket is in terms of derivations. You just have to take V, and then you do this uh, connecting homomorphism to U, and then get a map, compose them, and that's your bracket up to a sign. OK, so finally, um, with this, we're actually ready to get into the final proof. So in the last 10 minutes, I will actually bring together all these ingredients and tell you how to prove the theorem from the beginning. So uh, I'm going to start scrolling rapidly again, sorry about this. I just want to go up here and steal this. So I'm just going to grab this guy. I'm going to copy that. And put that there. Got a little stowaway. OK, so what I want to do is uh, prove this firm using all of the ingredients that we have so far. So the idea is um, what we're going to prove now that we have this description of bracketing with u. So remember what we're trying to do, I guess, now that we know that u is radical, we're trying to show that bracketing with u is no potent. Um, but now we know that bracketing with u is given by this theta type construction. Oops. Uh, so what we're actually going to prove is that this theta u thing acts no potently. OK, so it goes like this. Uh, there are two steps to the proof. And step one, uh, I'm going to be slightly hand wavy about. And step two, I'll get will be more concrete. Step one is just using some. Uh, facts about how connecting homomorphisms work, which is um, really just using the snake lemma. So um, this part, once, or you, once you know all the background theory, uh, you just use the snake lemma and check that everything is compatible. And so it will be, it's not the hardest step. Um, but what it involves, which is why I, I'm not going to explain it fully, is uh, we're going to take a resolution of M. So when you apply the snake lemma, you need your uh, complex in the middle of the thing to be uh, sort of a projective complex in order to be able to do the lifting up thing in the snake lemma. So I need a resolution of it. But this is an A module resolution. So let's say a resolution over A. And OK, so what does this mean? Um, P is in particular a complex, but I don't want it to be a complex of A modules because that would make it a complex of complexes. So that's not the correct way to say what a complex is over a DG algebra. The correct way to say what a complex is over a DG algebra is, i.e., P is a complex. Uh, 
and it has a a module structure. A tends to with P to P. And the correct compatibility condition is that this is a chain map. Um, so this is what's called a DG module. If you want to read about DG modules, then I think a nice reference to that is the, this paper called The Homology of Perfect Complexes by Avramov, Bopaiti, Yanger, and Miller, uh, which has all the background you need to be able to do that, in particular, to be able to just run the snake lemma with those. But uh, OK, so I have such a thing. I have this thing called a DG module over A. Uh, and it's going to be a resolution of M in the sense that it is a uh, P is a free A module. Um, so the underlying just graded module of it is actually free as an A module. And we can do better than that. Um, because, so here's the whole point, really. I'm assuming M has finite projective dimension. It's a finitely generated finite projective dimension. So that would mean that if I resolved it over S, so maybe I should have specified in here, so that's over S. Uh, I mean, if I resolved it over S, I would just have a finite free S module, plus like uh, the complex would be finite, and it would be of finite free S modules. Um, if I want to do this over A, the corresponding thing is that um, when I resolve M of uh, over A, this is going to be, which is free. Oh, I've already said it's free. So it's a free A module of finite rank. So this is another thing that you would find explained in this paper about uh, homology of perfect complexes. Just um, why uh, Starting from assuming that it has finite projected dimension over S, and because A is a resolution of S, that also it, it implies that it has finite projected dimension over A in the sense that it has a resolution, which is a finite free A module. OK. Whoops. So I know I'm being a little vague, but I'll tell you what I need from this. The setup really that I need is that OK, so we're given this data. We're given our u. Um, here is our this sort of delta thingy. And here is our, we were given a factorization of it, which goes through some m like this. Um, the point is, this implies that when I do my connecting homomorphism thingy, so I'm going to land inside ma, and I'm going to get theta u, and now it goes through p. OK, so I what I'm saying is just that given that u goes through this m, factors through this m, when I do the connecting homomorphism, it goes through this p, which is the resolution of m. So this is just something about how the snake lemma works, and it's actually quite straightforward if I were to properly explain DG modules and stuff like that. But all the, all the takeaway from step one is that given that a factors through this m, you can prove that this theta u factors through the resolution of m. So it factors through this p, and p is a uh, DG A module, which is free of finite rank. OK. So step two is just going to use this, the fact that theta of u goes through this p. OK. Uh, the proof of this is quite nice, and I'll do this properly. We have five minutes, so I can hopefully do this properly. So by step one, theta of u, the image of theta of u is contained inside the image of this map. So it's just uh, whatever theta of u spits out, it at least is contained in the image of this map. OK. Uh, the key point of this is that even though MA is an infinitely generated ideal that involves infinitely many variables, this P here is a finite free A module. So this image can only involve finitely many variables. So I can just check where do the, where do the generators of this finite free module go, and each of them only involves finitely many variables. So I can say this is definitely contained in an ideal involving only finitely many of the variables in some degrees. They could be in various degrees, but the degrees are going to be bounded anyway, because there's only many of them. So this lands in a finitely generated ideal. 
And this is really the whole point. All we needed really was something. This is all we're going to take away from it is that um, because of this, this theta u lands inside a finitely generated ideal. So the whole problem was that ma is infinitely generated, involves all these variables, but theta u now, given these hypotheses, lands in a finitely generated ideal. OK, so the key trick now is that if I start iterating, say, by some power m, this is going to land in the same finitely generated ideal. But now the degree of this, so remember, let's try to remember. The degree of this thing is 2. I'm always talking about pi 2, so we're landing in. We have something, some derivation of degree 2. So this lands in degree at least uh, 2m. Uh, I think I need to rephrase this. Yeah, sorry, uh, one second. So, no, no, it's, sorry, one second. Yeah, so theta of u of v. Uh, the point is that this is 0 if uh, the degree of v is bigger than the degree of all of these, say, the maximum degree of all these. So this is because. The uh, if uh, if this is true, then um, say this is uh, degree m. If this is true, then the degree of uh, v of something of degree m, uh, which must be uh, in this ideal here. If it's degree m and it's in this ideal, it must be decomposable because uh, it only involves these finitely many variables. But this degree is bigger than the degrees of all those variables. So it has to involve uh, something times, uh, it must be decomposable in the sense that it's a product of various things from the maximum ideal. But v is a derivation. So it satisfies this rule that it's v of x times y plus x times v of y. Uh, but this is in k. V is a derivation which lands in k. And in k, y is 0 and x is 0. These are in the maximum ideal. So this is just equal to 0. So sorry, I got slightly confused about my notes just at that point. But um, the point is that every derivation uh, into k is going to have to vanish uh, in sufficiently high degree. And this implies that theta to the m u of v is equal to 0. Right, because um, this thing is only going to, well, it implies that uh, I, or maybe a better way to phrase this is um, uh, theta of u uh, this, which is minus u bracket v, is equal to 0 if pi i, if um, V belongs to pi uh, sufficiently high degree of phi. So once I took it to be degree sufficiently high, uh, it bracketed with everything to be 0. And that implies that uh, um, if I start taking brackets over and over, the degree increases until I get have to get 0. So uh, well, add of u to some high power of v. That involves taking uh, the bracket of u with something of high degree, so that has to be 0. OK. Right, so um, in the end, the point was, since I landed in a finitely generated ideal, 
uh, every derivation has to uh, every der derivation of sufficiently high degree has to vanish on it. Okay. All right. Cool. Any questions? Okay. So thank you, Bren. Uh, ben. Uh, we we invite questions. People can uh, open their mouth and ask questions. Okay, I have before anybody thinks about a question. I, I have an uh, obvious question. Right. So we look at the quotient module i mod i square. Yes. Uh, but but suppose I, I want to look at a finitely generated sub module of a free module and replace the ideal i by that sub module, and then take the quotient by second symmetric power. I see. Um. That's that's uh, you know, and then ask whether whether the uh, sub module of uh, free module is locally uh, generated by the right number of elements. And one can talk about the quotient module being projective. Yeah. So instead of I, you have a I don't know. I told a sitting inside a free R module N. Uh, yeah. I'm confused about what is the the role of S. S would be uh, something. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. There is some question here, but I'm not in, entirely sure what the statement yeah. would be. At least in local algebra, whenever we have an ideal contained in a ring, then uh, we uh, uh, this is not enough for many applications to algebraic geometry, where we do come across submodules of free modules and uh, corresponding analogs. Uh, many times they have uh, correct answer, uh, but by totally different methods. Uh, True. Um, OK, so I'm slightly unclear of what the exact statement would be, but I agree that there's probably something here. And then um, I, I, one would guess, one would hope that the same proof might work for that, but yeah. I don't know. In the, no, I mean, it may not work because at yeah, least may not. from whatever uh, experience I have about uh, multiplicity theory, um, totally different methods have to be applied when we deal with symmetric powers and uh, these things. And, but many times, uh, really good analogs of the results are useful. Uh, right. Questions in singularity theories, uh, they often require that we deal with finitely generated submodule of free module rather than just an ideal in a ring. Yeah. So are there questions? Uh, any questions? Yeah, I, I don't see questions, which means everything is clear, uh, what Ben said. Uh, it is, uh, of course, a fantastic piece of algebra. Ben, thank you very much for coming to this seminar. And thanks for really inviting me. It. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So th thanks, thanks a lot. Okay. And we hope to see you again.